Hello, everybody. Welcome to Artist at Work at the Boca Raton Museum of Art. Today, we get to hear from an artist who is included in our Glass Dress Boca Raton 2021 exhibition. Tim Tate is co-founder of the Washington Glass School and Studio. He is an award-winning artist, including the Virginia Groot Foundation Award for Sculpture, a Fulbright Award from Sunderland University in England, and an award from the Museum of American Glass in New Jersey as one of the rising stars of the 21st century. We're going to jump right into hearing Tim talking about his work. So please welcome Tim Tate. Much of my work spans several centuries. It'll go from Victorian formalism, as you see this piece in front of you, a very formal Victorian piece, cast lead crystal frame. And it's, of course, it's, it has that look, but it also is powered by 21st century technology. So I like bridging those centuries as we go through. Sometimes a story gets me. I read something in a magazine that said that where the bee populations were down, also the dragonfly populations were down, but where the bee populations were high, there were numerous dragonflies. So in my mind, I have, I have <laughs> dragonflies protecting the bees for all of us. So that's what that particular one is. I have a whole series of these very, you know, kind of achingly beautiful Victorian florals. And most of them are in res my response to uh, Virginia Woolf's book, Mrs. Dalloway. And Mrs. Dalloway, um, the very first line of that book is considered one of the first lines in feminist literature. And it said that today, Mrs. Dalloway thought she would buy the flowers as opposed to her normal prescribed role of gathering flowers in the garden and making arrangements because if she would go to London, she would be, you know, breaking her tradition and also going to see her secret lover in London. So it's uh, an interesting beginning of that book. And because of it, I do a lot of these very formal floral arrangements in these endless mirror presences. I also do a lot of things with uh, spiritualism. I was a Buddhist for many years, and uh, this is called the, the Bodhisattva of Compassion. And that is a Buddha that was enlightened, but cared so much about others that they remained behind to help. And so it's also known as the Buddha of a Thousand Arms. And I just love that compassion that speaks to all the people taking care of us today in this world, this pandemic world. You know, when you're studying mirrors, you cannot help but go back to, to Versailles because that is the giant mirrored room in Versailles. And because of that, I wanted to do a piece that in my mind could have fit easily in the Versailles had they had the technology. And this would have seemed like magic at the time, but this piece could have been easily put within Versailles and it fit right in, I think. So that's, a, that's one of the newer works I have. Now I'm gonna kind of go into my pieces that speak on activism as this final piece does. Uh, this path here is uh, called Two Paths Taken. And that is, you see the magic eight ball in the middle and that magic eight ball was discerning the future, but on those two domes, on the inner dome, I have my life as it was changed uh, when I was diagnosed as HIV positive in the mid nineties, early, what am I saying? Late eighties. And so that is the inner dome, the inner dome, the outer dome, of course, is my fantasy of what my life would have been like uh, had that been negative that day. When you see a plus sign on my work, it is not a cross, it is a positive symbol, as in COVID positive, HIV positive, and all the pandemics that always begins with those positive symbols. And I use it here to kind of empower with it. Uh, and along that line, I use this as, it's called a century of longing. You see the hand holding the bouquet on top. Uh, that Video is the first time two men were ever recorded dancing. It is 1896. It is in Thomas Edison's studio. And he was trying to see if sound would link up with movement. And so you see the man playing there and they're dancing to that. And that three minutes that they dance, they could never have imagined that over a century later, 
that it would be an iconic image to of kind of human rights in the gay culture. So that particular image is very uh, well known within that. I also did the New Orleans AIDS Monument. If you're down in uh, in uh, Washington Square inside the French Quarter, you can visit this piece. It was on NCI uh, NCI New Orleans last two weeks ago. So uh, it's a piece I felt very strongly about uh, and it took 12 years to come to fruition, but uh, there it is. Also, uh, this very war-torn world is a frightening thing to me. When I saw the image of the, many of you remember, of a small five-year-old boy washed ashore after in Syria after his parents were trying to flee the war-torn nation they came from and the little boy drowned at sea. It uh, was very uh, disturbing to me and I wanted some way to honor him. So you see on the, uh, the full pieces on the right, on the left, you see those boats in a circle, all with nowhere to go and the remembrance carnation between each of them. And how do I show war? Well, I didn't want to fetishize weaponry or bombs or tanks or any of that. But what meant war to me was uh, Picasso's Guernica. And so those are actually images from Picasso's Guernica put through a 3D printer and then in bas relief. So every line he drew is raised. And so we took all of the images from Guernica and surrounded this piece in endless war, to give you an idea. Here's another piece where we hide from no one uh, for so much of uh, the 20th century, uh, gay people had to hide their, you know, who they were from people. Even today, people have to hide themselves. I want there to be a future where no one has to hide who they are from anyone. So that's a video in there on that eyeball. That eyeball blinks at you as you're going by. Uh, this is a big 42 inch round piece. And it's a, it's a hope that all of us have for the future that no one must hide who they are for anyone. Uh, another piece along this series is We Rose Up and these endless mirrors, we know that they're only um, an illusion, right? We, we understand how they work, they're an illusion. You just can't help but look down that four foot tunnel. But I would say that since they're an illusion that the that is only in your mind that tunnel exists, that means we can make this part up any to anything we want. We can give the physics or reality to that space to anywhere we wish because it's in our mind, we can make it. So in this particular piece, you might see everyone that I had lost uh, during the AIDS crisis, 14 people, eight in one year, there they are, they're alive again. And they're saying, we're okay. And it's so good to be remembered as we go through these. So in my piece, this one, which is at the Tacoma Museum uh, is there because I wanted to give those people life again and not let them ever feel not remembered. Here's a little video of this piece, just to give you an idea of I as an artist and how I would how I would kind of see it. And also just to show you the sheer depth of some of these, uh, it's pretty astounding. Um, they say that in an endless mirror, if you can see past 13 images, you are seeing into the next world. And indeed in, this one you see 16 images. So you do see into the next world, except for it's not quite distinct. You can't exactly see what the next world is. So we leave those indistinct images to faith to figure that out. Uh, I moved by poetry as well. Here's the, in my mind, the 14 people that I had lost. Uh, I forgot which museum this one's at, but um, it comes, the title comes from the Wordsworth poem that goes, um, no one can relive the hour of splendor in the grass or glory in the flower, but let us grieve not, but rather gain strength in what remains behind. Many of you know that poem. I just wanted that to center on this. It sounds morbid, but I am honoring those people. I am not thinking of it in terms of morbidity at all. I'm just thinking of it as something that's interesting. Now we're gonna get up to glass dress. Um, I don't know how many of you know what glass dress is. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background to it. 
Uh, Glass Dress is the brainchild of the great and powerful Adriano Barengo. And it's a sanctioned uh, collateral event for the Venice Biennale. Uh, it, it started taking place in 2009. Uh, it's a very important show, especially in Europe, especially during the Venice Biennale. And its mission is to show how contemporary artists use glass as kind of an incomparable, medi incomparable medium for their self-expression. Um, it sort of continues the mission of Peggy Guggenheim, where she would bring fine artists such as Picasso. She would bring them to Murano and she would expose them the glass and assign gaffers who would help them make their vision come true. And so we're, this is really a, uh, an extension of Peggy Guggenheim's dream that was there. Uh, Glass Death 2009, the very first one, uh, was curated by the glass expert Rosa Barovia, oh, excuse me, Barovia Mintasti, and the art historian Laura Matteoli Rossi. And was, it was mainly historic. Uh, it was the display of masterpieces from art glass from 1920 to the present times. It had art glass from artists like Joseph Albers, Man Ray, Louise Bourgeois, uh, Robert Rauschenberg. You may remember his glass tire that he did uh, several years ago. So some of those artists at the same time were expressly invited by Adriano Barengo to come to this also to make glass in the way that Peggy would. And that was Tony Craig, Fred Wilson, and several others. You all may know Fred Wilson. I think he's on the board of the Whitney and a variety of other museums. And of course, his work is so well known. Now, if you represent a country, if you are the lead artist for a country in their pavilion, you will be asked to come to Brango to create glass if you so desire. And of course, a lot of people do. Uh, they work with the master blowers and casters. And they realize this amazing artistic vision that they couldn't have normally. Uh, they are soon to have one of the largest casting studios in Europe. That's according to Adriano. I don't know if he's been to the Czech Republic, but there's gonna, he's gonna have some competition. But you know, with Adriano, you never know that man could do it. Uh, he's an astounding person. Glass Dress tends to focus on sculptural work with meaning and conceptual work. Uh, it's very rarely abstract, but they do have astounding works and all of the pieces tend to tell a story. And that uh, is one of the things I like most about Glass Dress. Uh, so now this one is at the Bocreto Museum and also a similar parallel uh, show to this one at Bocreto is going to open in October at the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, Russia. This piece is mine from last glass dress in 2019. And this one is called the Endless Cycle. And for every man you see on the left hand side, uh, a thousand people die from gun violence in the United States every year. And for every gun you see on the right hand side, a child dies every day. Another disturbing fact. And as an artist, I tend to work through my anxiety by creating work. So I get a call. Adriano said, come on by, have lunch with Ai Weiwei. I want to ask you something. Well, I thought I didn't. <laughs> I didn't totally believe them because it's around the corner from my house, but I would go to lunch. There they are having lunch. And so that was how I began. And that's how I was asked to go forward with this piece. You know, Adriana and I met many years ago. Uh, I think it was at Sofa Chicago. And uh, he and I both shared a similar view of what was happening in glass today. And I was really uh, excited to have him ask me finally to be a part of Glass Dress. Not everybody who goes is a glass artist already. Most people are fine artists outside of it. So to be asked uh, was an amazing privilege and I was extremely thankful to him for it. <laughs> there we go. That's where I got the invitation to come to Venice and actually work on the piece itself. Uh, it's called Justinian's Oculus. And also in the book, it's called Pandemic Oculus. It's because someone told me that if I put Justinian's Oculus, it would be off-putting, but this group I'm going to tell you exactly what that means so that you can understand that, uh, especially if you're a docent, I'd like you to know the full breadth of what this piece is about. So Justinian was the emperor of, uh, from Rome who lived in Constantinople in 541 AD. And at that time, he was one of the very first people to actually contract the bubonic plague. 
And while he survived, one fifth of Constantinople did not. And they started naming it Justinian's plague because Justinian uh, was thought of as to have brought it to Constantinople. And he used to say he would look in the mirror and he would be haunted by the people who had passed in Constantinople. Well, keep in mind that for me, this is my second pandemic. And you know, for, with the, this being my second, my, my first one, of course, was the AIDS pandemic. But for me, um, I've lost so many souls to both. I've lost souls to COVID. I've lost many souls to HIV. And it's, it's very strange that the mind will play this trick on us where we forget so much what has only happened and what only this moment has passed, but we hold clear and bright the memory of what happened years ago you know, of men and women long since dead. Uh, yet, yet, who can say if that's real or not? In the sense that, you know, how can I believe these friends of mine are gone when every night as I go to sleep, they're still whispering into my ears. So, you know, for me, all these people will always remain a living truth uh, within my mind. So that's what this piece really was about to a degree. I wanted to honor the very rich history of Italian glassmaking and Italian Renaissance and the beauty of that. So the frame, uh, we made the frame uh, first and then we went forward. Now, here's where the problem kind of came in. We were asked to do this in February of 2020. If you recall, all shipment to Italy and, and other places stopped in mid-March. So all, I didn't know that was coming, but I knew that I had to turn, turn this around quickly. So I'm gonna show you this process of making the piece that ultimately became Justinian or the pandemic Oculus. Uh, my studio is outside of Washington, DC. Uh, so we started making waxes, lots of waxes. And I wanted to have as many faces as I could, sexes, ages, races. I wanted everyone I could think of to find a face in there that we, they would recognize and feel that they were being represented. Um, this was the final of the wax. I took all the color out so I could try to imagine which color I wanted the final piece to be. But as you see, there were many, of, I forgot how it was, 110 different faces. Uh, and that just is that same thing that Justinian said, I see the people who have passed in my life and I see them in those mirrors. And there they are, you know, alive again. So there's a better view of the faces. You can kind of see it as well. By the way, on the frame here, what we had is that we found a frame without the flowers, but we had the cross hatch, which I love. But the, it just had a bull nose edge. So we dug the bull, row, the bull nose edge out in four places and replaced that with uh, wax roses to make this beautiful or not very Italian Renaissance uh, frame since I was honoring that period in history. So there's, our, there's the final piece before we make the mold and make the mold we did a very, very large four foot mold, which weighed a ton, but we had to ship this out. Well, I couldn't ship out waxes because I was afraid it would get stuck someplace with the heat high and I would have melted waxes and I would lose the opportunity at all of being in glass dress. So we made the rubber mold and shipped it to Venice. We also shipped Judy Chicago's with us because I had a really good quick pipeline to uh, Murano. And so my mold and Judy Chicago's mold headed out the day before everything shut down, or actually got there the day before everything shut down. So this is the team. You know, people talk a lot about master blowers, but at Baringo Studios, they also have master casters. And that's Alan Horsey on the left. I mean, they're an astounding team. If you ever are getting work made there, feel rest assured that your work will come out as professionally as you can imagine. So that was a great moment for me. Here's the very first mold they made. Uh, my, the first uh, wax, rather. This is my mold here on the outside. That pink is the beautiful color wax they use that I would love that wax. If I could find that color in glass, that piece, I would use that as a frame in a minute. Beautiful wax color. And so you see the step-by-step -step process they're going through. Here's the plaster image of the center so they can make sure that the frame is always 
circular, and we're going to make the frame and the center in two different pieces because we're going to have slight differences. First of all, in thickness, that made it very hard to put it with it, but also in coloring. So there's their first wax and that beautiful pink wax, uh, salmon wax of the initial people. You can kind of get a much better idea of a lot of these people as you go through. There's, there's lots of uh, women's faces throughout. Anyway, there's a lot of different people. Some you could even recognize. When I chose the color, I didn't want a happy color. You know, I didn't want a bright yellow or, you know, I didn't want anything like that. I wanted much more of a somber color. And so we found this olive glass and it was just perfect for the exterior. There they are in the kiln before we add the glass. So that is in Venice. Now keep in mind, I am now locked out of going to help work on it in Venice. So because I'm locked out of all that, I am doing all this by Zoom and WhatsApp and we are doing all this on virtual uh, zooms and uh, and calling so the entire process we had to kind of do uh, long distance which was an unusual way to make a piece there it is all empty of glass so here they are piling up that's the olive glass on the right that's the uranium glass i don't know if you know what uranium glass is but it's a very bright yellow green if i put a black light on it you would see a bright yellow green glow uh, and I wanted that intensity of color because I knew I was going to knock that color back, but I wanted it to have the intensity of color. I'll show you where that comes in just a little bit later. And there they are finally fired. There's that amazingly bright color, but it was a little too bright, but that was what I needed it to be. Uh, this I love. I love this picture mostly because there is the frame emerging out of the mold still crumbled upon it. But behind me, this big dinosaur looking thing is Ai Weiwei's new chandelier. And then there's the sign saying no photography. So it had all kinds of good things. I could ignore the no photography sign and I could see the Ai Weiwei right behind me. So that was a, that was a joy. And there's the, you see the frame now emerging out of the plaster. So there's the final frame without a lot of light on it. It looks black, but it's really that beautiful dark olive green. Since there you get a much better idea. This is from the backside, but you see how beautiful it is when light comes through it and that gorgeous cross hatch, et cetera, is on there. The center being an oculus, meaning a mirror, uh, we had to polish first. So this is them polishing the center part and they're gonna mirror the back of that before they put it back in. There it is inside. And as you see right now, it's very hard to see the faces and it's a very different color than what's inside but we always knew we were going to knock it back with black inks and paints. So we had a transparent black paint that was rubbed into this because look how much detail is showing here versus where there is none in there. And I wanted people to be able to see that detail easily. This is how they moved it throughout the entire studio. They have, not only they have master blowers, they have engineers come in to devise hanging mechanisms, which the museum can tell you how easily it did hang. And you see here inside the stainless steel, that was, this is the plans for the stainless steel backing that goes on this behind the piece. So you see they're attaching that stainless steel edge. It even has a lip for a mechanical hold as well. And you can kind of get a nice side view on those floral so here it is now we've knocked back that uranium black light green to much more of a, a color that goes better with that the somberness of the piece so there's the final piece right there um, i was immensely proud of it i i was really happy that the marengo studio people love the piece because they saw that i was giving a nod to these traditions and to the current crisis that was going on so uh, here we are with Italian Renaissance noting the plague and noting the pandemic that's current. I did a variation or they're doing a variation now that will end up looking like this. And this one is gonna go to the Hermitage in October in St. Petersburg, uh, Russia. So um, I can do it now because I could color ship, but that's actually what it's being cast in and uh, I was so proud to be asked to be in the Hermitage uh, show as well. And of course, with Adriano, there are always more plans. Uh, and those, uh, I can't even tell you now, but prepare on 2020 
two for Amazing Plans. And I guess that pretty much ends my, my time. Well, thank you, Tim. You really took us through that whole process of the things that you have to do to, to create the work that we get to show. So um, that's quite a treat to get to hear directly from you. Um, I wanted to ask anybody um, if you have any questions. I know Tim is really good with, with Q&A, and I know we have lots of people on with, um, with good questions. Um, I've already heard from Giov Giovanni. She said, awesome. So <laughs> you get that. Yep, yep. Um, and then I have another question from Claire saying, do you envision working with Barango in the future? Yeah. Uh, right now, they are working on the piece for the Hermitage. And uh, I have a proposal for Beringo for the following year. We'll see if they like that proposal, but um, I envision that I will, in some way, in some capacity, always work somehow with Beringo Studio. Nice. Um, and then from Mary, she says, Tim, could you review the process that is used to create the earlier works you showed us? Uh, okay, it's called Lost Wax. And what that means is I may, if you remember, I made that big rubber mold and that rubber mold became wax. After we pulled, after we pulled the pieces out, they poured wax into that rubber mold and then they encased those waxes into a plaster base. That was then steamed, steamed out, all the wax was steamed out of that. And now I had a plaster base uh, hollow negative that I could melt glass into. They then melted glass into that hollow void broke away the plaster and now I have a glass that looks exactly like the original wax or the original mold that we had created. So it's kind of a mini step process, but at the end it duplicates what I can make in wax. Now I can make that in glass. If I can make it in wax, I can make it in glass now. Nice. Um, and then she put also on that, she said, she just, her question is, um, how is it that you got the mirror effect? I think she's talking about that continuous mirror effect. So in the earlier work. Oh, in the mirror effects, of course. All right. Yep. So in those, um, when I was a kid uh, in the oh, long ago, it was in the, before the summer of love, I'll just say that. And uh, I had somehow in the back of a magazine found Spencer Gifts. And so I begged my parents to go to Spencer Gifts but I lived in Washington, D.C., and the closest Spencer Gift was in the Paramus, New Jersey Mall. And somehow I convinced my parents to drive up to Paramus, New Jersey Mall, just so I could go to Spencer Gifts. And inside, they had a tiny endless mirror, and I bought it and took it apart to learn how to do that. And that was back in the, in the 60s somewhere. And uh, that's how I first learned about it. But I can give you the easy way. You've seen it in films frequently, Citizen Kane, all about Eve, all of those have beautiful endless mirror imagery. And basically, if you put two mirrors facing each other with light in it, anything in there is going to always be endlessly seen on either side. So it's that simple. There's light inside. The front piece of glass is actually black glass. So light does not, uh, you can't really see through it, but light is so bright inside that it erases the color of the glass, but the little silvering on the inside makes it bounce back and forth. So. I hope that was clear. Yeah. So um, we have another question. Since you are a glass artist, did you learn anything new, new technique-wise? Oh, yeah. I mean, those guys, they are amazing master casters. So the things they were doing, I hadn't even contemplated. The engineering of that holder, the way that they centered that to make sure it was round, they were doing a lot of things that I was really happy to learn from. I think, I hope I never stop learning. And least of all, from people like the master casters at Beringo Studio. Plus, they had a lot of different types of glass. I hope they learned a few things from me as well. And uh, I think it was the first time they had used uranium glass there. And so I was happy to, and, uh, and if I can help the other way, it's even better for me. Nice. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about the 21st century glass page. Sure. Okay. So yeah. if, you're, if you're on Facebook, and um, you are interested in 21st century glass, myself and William Warmitz, who was the former curator of the Corning Museum of Glass, have a Facebook page called 21st Century Glass. 
21st century glass frequently does not resemble the studio glass we know of from the 20th century. It has a very broader aspect, a much broader aspect, and it's much more common in the fine art world, which is totally embraced glass at this point. So if you ever want to know what the state of glass is like in the world now in the 21st century, because now we're 20 years in, go to the 21st century glass page on Facebook and there are 10,000 images to show you how that has changed and how it's also stayed the same in some ways. But you can get an idea of what that glass world is like beyond saying, you know, I know Dale Chihuly or those names, you're gonna see astounding people. Ai Weiwei and, and Olafur Eliasson. And there's so many people in the fine art world that use glass with all their heart in a slightly different way than we're used to, but no less interesting. Okay. So we also have a question about who are your influences? Oh, you know, they, you know, they all started because I do so much video. They all started with people like Joseph von Sternberg, who did the cat, you know, the uh, Scarlet Empress. With uh, there's so many people in there now. And in terms of the glass world, what I do is I, if I want to be inspired, which I always do, I go to the, the Miami Art Fairs, and I go through it every year. I have a new set of influences because I absolutely love going down there and. My influences change at all times. I mean, my that, that kind of Victorian techno fetishism I do is influenced by Jules Verne as a kid reading about the things that were on Captain Nemo's vessel. But at the same time, I'm just as inspired by Ai Weiwei's new work as well. So I float and I'm I fluid as to who my biggest influences are because if you ask me that in two hours, it'll be different than if you ask me now and. That changes, but I'm happy that it's fluid to that degree. Okay, then a question about um, your pandemic Oculus. How did you make the frame? So the frame we we found we found a frame um, in an antique store that had that cross hatch. Remember, if you remember the cross hatch of the inner part of that, uh, but it wasn't overly. And we had it here for a while. We didn't know what we would do with it. But when we got the access to glass dress, we thought if we can make that look Italian Renaissance, it'd be perfect. So we took the wax of the just the frame without the flowers. And then it had a one inch bullnose edge all the way around the outside edge. We cut that one inch bullnose edge out in four places and replaced it with wax flowers. And then we made the mold of the whole thing. And now that mold, it looks exactly as you see. Now we have a we have a mold of that frame. Nice. Which I've used again, if you remember that very first slide of what my work my work table looked like, that frame was the same frame you saw on Justinian's Oculus. So we got to see lots of different works today. Um, which ones are your favorites? Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Well, <laughs> Most artists will tell you whatever they're making next is their favorite. And that's pretty close or whatever, whatever I just made. But honestly, I put some of my favorites up there. I mean, I've made a lot of work. So limiting it down, I mean, I kind of did that in a way. I limited it down to some of the work I really love so much. So in a sense, that slideshow was uh, a walkthrough of my some of my favorite works. I didn't go very far back. I didn't go to a lot of the video work and the older work. I kind of kept everybody in the in the current series of works that I'm working on now. Nice. And then we have the question, can you describe your studio and do you offer classes? We uh, do have a large studio here. Of course, classes are curtailed. Uh, not everywhere is in Florida. So up here, we have to curtail our classes to a degree, although we come in every day. Uh, we have very stringent COVID um, restrictions, but we have about 5,000 square feet. We have several people who work out here who are very well-known artists like Michael Janis. We also have an incubator space for brand new artists who want to have a studio but don't have room for it, so they, they do that. Uh, we have quite a few classes, although they've been kind of made smaller and we don't have as many during COVID. We used to have you know 12 and 16 people in a class. We're doing four people per class. We're limiting those until the restrictions, the restrictions for classes are lifted in Maryland. But I'm sure that'll come in time. 
So your studio is in Maryland? It's well, we're inside the beltway of Washington, DC, but the way Washington and DC works is it's right where Virginia and Maryland combine. So okay. we're right between that, but we're one block out of DC into Maryland. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're very close to that, but that's why it's the Washington Classical. Yeah. That's the name of the Washington Classical. Cool. So um, Giovanni asks, have you ever had to replace or repair a damaged work whilst on exhibit? Uh, you know, the worst thing ever happened, I had a brand new exhibit, a major piece, I sent it down and the plug that plugs into it, the simplest thing in the entire thing had been sent in reverse polarity to what I needed. So that was very stressful. And of course, the gallery hadn't opened it until the actual night of the exhibit. So that was a little bit stressful, but we even got through that. So. Um, Fortunately, for the most part, uh, while it's on exhibit, we have not had to, but that one was very uh, difficult. I mean, stressful, but it was it was fixed, so no problem. And then could you tell us a little bit more? We saw the, um, your AIDS memorial in New Orleans, and you said it was a 12-year a process. How, like, what took so long and what was that process like working for a public art like that? Well, uh, it was odd. I was in New Orleans uh, in the mid nineties, something like that towards the end of the nineties. And I was at a bar like everybody else in Mardi Gras. And these people next to us said, oh yeah, we're the new people that are doing the public art for the new AIDS monument. Well, I'd had so many losses and I thought this is my chance to give something back. And so on it, they said, why, what do you got? You got something? I said, I have this great thing. And I quickly drew something up. I had nothing until they asked me, but I drew this piece up and basically it was these beautiful kind of portals, round portals where we would see people who had passed or have been affected by HIV in many ways. And in some of the spaces, it would say words like wife, mother, son, friend, teacher, so that everyone could go up and feel the loss that they had on this. Uh, it became the uh, end of the candlelight vigil they hold every year in New Orleans for uh, AIDS. They say victims, if you want to call them victims. I don't really call it that. But uh, so frequently I'll get pictures of from people who seen my name on the monument and then texted me and they'll show flowers inside, you know, on the on the actual monument especially during Christmas. And it's, uh, it's a nice thing for me to see that people are still revering it, uh, even today. Uh, and even on NCI New Orleans, where, where they walked by twice, uh, several different episodes, but I was really, they actually had to call me in advance to make sure it was all right. And I was like, yes, it's fine. Nice. Well, we have a nice thank you that says, thank you for a wonderful talk and a peek into your artwork. Uh, thank so you I, all for coming. Yeah. I appreciate you, especially all you docents. I love you with all my heart. So uh, please, you're the first line of telling people about the work. So I hope you uh, can take some of that in with you. Right. Well, thank you, Tim, so much for, for you, giving us that peek. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for attending today. And as always, um, please consider renewing your museum membership gifting a membership or making a donation, you can easily text Boca Muse to 44321. And we appreciate you attending today. Thank you.